Again, my name is Rowan Richards. I'm the executive director, the founder of the Stewards Market, and uh, you know, more importantly, I'd like to say that I am I am a, a child of God, a follower of God, and that is critical to everything that we're doing. Um, I enjoy what I'm doing more than you could ever imagine, and I wanted to be here today to kind of share a little bit about that, about what we're doing, share a little bit about the experience. Um, most importantly, though, I just want to be here and be part of the conversation that's taking place on this campus already. What's happening here is actually quite remarkable. Um, from the conversations I've had and the campuses I've visited, this, doesn't, this isn't happening everywhere. The fact that social justice um, is so uh, deeply integrated into the business, uh, business studies, MBA program, is remarkable. And um, so I feel honored and privileged to, to be here and be part of this today. So as I thought about you know, what we're going to discuss today, you know, I had about probably 10 different ideas on which direction to take. And if we had talked, you know, at, if it was last year I came in, it would be a completely different conversation. Completely different. It would have been pretty practical, give you some, you know, some solid steps on how you can launch a social enterprise. But I would not have been able to share a lot of the experiences we've had this year. So uh, based on that, we decided that this was the most fitting conversation to have today. Figuring out how to start your business, how to launch an enterprise, which direction to take, and allowing God to literally direct and order those steps and direct your planning. As you heard, our, our mission is developing these lasting solutions to break the systems of poverty. And this came about from, again, years of experience and trial and error. I'll give you a little bit, a little bit of a uh, little bit of the story behind how the stewards market came to be. Came to Chicago in 2001. I came in 2001 and immediately was plugged into um, a community called Cabrini Green. Oh, is it anyone here from Chicago familiar with Chicago? No. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so <laughs> Cabrini Green actually doesn't even exist anymore. Um, it's it's been changed. You know, uh, there's pros and cons. On, that's a whole other conversation. But at the time, it was probably the the most one of the most well known housing projects um, in the country. Definitely in Chicago. Plugged in there, and you know, I was coaching and tutoring. I was part of a church plant in the community, and was asked to teach financial literacy to an adult population at one specific church. And that was that's how this all started, really. And did that for over the course of a couple of years, did some entrepreneurial training as well. And it was good. We saw, we saw some people's lives actually being transformed just through changing specific habits. But for the most part, it wasn't having the impact. We weren't seeing it widespread throughout the community. So it was at that time I started thinking, okay, well, what are some of the needs? And started asking questions. And they'd be like, well, you know, Mr. Rowan, I, thank you for showing me how to, to put a budget together, but um, the top line of my budget is zero. I have no income, so what, what am I budgeting exactly? And you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. Sorry about that. <laughs> So you start thinking like, okay, there's, there it is, right? It's been laid in front of you. There's a big problem. And obviously this isn't, this isn't the whole story, right? There's other things as well, which we'll get into in a little bit. But that kicked off the idea is like we need to be developing opportunities. We need to be creating, creating. And if you think about it, right, who are we made in the image of? We were made in the image of the creator, and we've been called to create. So it makes sense that that would be what we're called to. So I wish I could say that, like, oh yeah, a week later, Bo had the idea, had the business plan, we were rolling. But it was more like four years, to be honest. <laughs> so I literally thought, all right, so I'm, I'm, I jump around a little bit, I'm sorry. So bear with me. At the time, I came to Chicago, baseball was done, and I was starting the new career in the financial industry as a futures trader. 
And I thought for sure that was going to be the bridge. That would be the way in which, here I am every day, I'm surrounded with you know, literally millionaires, right? Multi-millionaires. In the morning, up until 2 o'clock, because that's the life of a trader. If you guys are interested, it's, you know, it's pretty good to schedule. <laughs> 7 to 2 and then you have the rest of your day. And then in the afternoons, I'm in Cabrini Green, where you know, unemployment could be 25% to 40%, right? And like, okay, here I am. I'm in between these two. This, this got to be it. God, you, you've got me here for a reason. No question. It's going to be through trading. And I tried. You know, we tried different ways. Brought people in to intern and did some training. And it, it just it never happened. It never was the right fit. And years later, I look back on you know, it and I see, you know, that I, was, I thought that was going to be able to transform lives through trading. Right? That was my idea. That was my plan for it. Well, God was looking at me and saying, yeah, that's great, but in what way will you be transformed, Ron? So at the time, I'm not thinking that, but having years of, of, of experience now in what we're doing, I realized that so much of it was about me as well. That would have been easy. I could have got people in, right? Maybe some people make a lot of money, and then I would have felt really good about myself, and that would have been, that would have been it. But where, how would my life have been transformed, right? In what way would that help in my sanctification? Right? Where would the relationships be? You know, where would, where would the opportunities be for me to be in the pit with somebody and help walk with them as they move out of that? So four years later, we finally got a few things started. So let me take you now to where the stewards market is today. The roles of the stewards market. You know, we've been developing this for a while and we feel we really hit it well last year. Where we keep it simple. The stewards market is, is the nonprofit ministry. And its purpose is developing these social enterprises, these businesses with a justice focus. Second is to prepare individuals. We work with a population mainly of 18 to 25 year olds, young men, mostly African American and Latino. We invite young women as well, but it seems that who are drawn to us are young men, mostly. So this second one is key. So we start these businesses, we think we have some great ideas, right? Some of them, some, some are, are meant to continue, some will not, but we have these ideas and we work to develop them from the ground up. We were hiring, we've always been hiring, but what we realized this past year is that hiring was fine, and it's a great opportunity, right? Because beyond employment, it's also a chance for discipleship, okay? We want to bring these young men and women in so we can just have a chance just to have impact on their lives, right? Build them a community that's different from what they have been experiencing. But as far as the training goes, we were, we were doing, in a way, doing a disjustice, an injustice, because we weren't developing their talent in a way where they can move up through the businesses, right? They were getting the entry-level position, which is wonderful, but that's where they were staying. We, we would have, there were days where we were like, okay, we have a specific role that needs to be filled. And we have these young folks around with talent, but they weren't prepared to fill those gaps. So then we would have to go outside and bring other people in. So well, what it would look like if we were fully investing in the development of this individual? Everything from personal development to job skills, workforce development, all the while mentoring and disciple them and, and helping bring along that life transformation as well. What would that look like? And in a few minutes here, I'm gonna show you. First, I want to just, again, go through some of these, these social enterprises. So the first one on there, King Lizzie Apparel, that was, that was launched in 2009. T-shirts, hand-painted sneakers, hats, you know, the whole streetwear um, idea. Um, King Lizzie Recording Studio, which is really closely tied to the clothing line, that's actually the most recent one. That was launched last fall, and it's a full-service recording studio. Soap is a hotel sustainability, a recycling uh, business. And then we've partnered with these next two, CJK Foods, which is a private chef service, catering. Uh, this, the guy who launched that actually interned for us. He went to, uh, he's a Moody Bible Institute student, he interned for us. And he's always talk. he's a foodie, right? He's always talking about the food, he'd make food for us, which was great. I mean, you have an intern who's a chef, that's like, <laughs> you really can't beat that. 
and he was really good on social media, which I am not. So originally he was, I forget what his original job title was supposed to be. Like he was, after that I was just like, just stay on Hootsuite the entire day. That's all you do. Just man Twitter and Facebook and, and we're good. And he did a great job of it. This next one, Ignite Progress, is test prep academic coaching business. And what I like about, about this so much is obviously it's, he's really good at what he does. Here's a guy who took a huge chance. He started his business in around the communities where he grew up. So North Shore in Chicago, very affluent communities. Great school system. And that's where he stayed. That was his bread and butter, right? He already had he had network. So from a from a planning standpoint, he hit it, right? He hit a home run. Like that's where he needed to be. This past year he said, that's cool, but that's not where God's got my heart. He had always volunteered in a neighborhood called uh, North Lawndale. And he said, what if I could somehow do the same thing that I'm doing in the North Shore in North Lawndale? And obviously, you can imagine his board is like, you're crazy. This is a for-profit business. It's a for-profit business. You can't do that, right? Like, it's, it's not even close. You have, again, you have the 18 to 20 percent unemployment, you know, lots of crime. The schools are, you know, often are failing. You know, you'll, on a scale of one to ten, these schools are, you know, one to three is where they're scoring. He said, I'm, I'm doing it. So he shifted. He shifted his whole model. 80% of his, cu his customers are now in the North Lawndale community. 20% remain in the North Shore. And he's actually, his business is, this is the best year he's ever had. I mean, it's just, it's a testament to God. This is faithfulness, right? Being obedient and just watching God do what, what God does. <laughs> and this next one here, I'm really excited about. We had a chance to talk about it. Um, so keep this in prayer for us. You know, it's not a done deal, but there's a chance that we can get into the alternative energy uh, business, which you know, in itself is probably not that exciting. What's exciting about it is the number of opportunities it would create for young men and women on Chicago's west and south side. Imagine this. I can take, we can take 15, uh, initially 15 to 20 individuals from, from West Humble Park who currently are unemployed. Many have not graduated from high school. Many have been incarcerated. Several who have, who currently are formerly a part of, of gangs in Chicago. Bring them into the community of the Stewards Market. Continue to pour into them, share the gospel, love on them, develop them with the skill sets that are necessary to be successful in this industry. Train them, get them certified on how to build solar panels, how to install solar panels, how to build microgrids, okay? Which here is not a big deal. Parts of the world, that is incredible. That is changing communities, right? Where the power sources are not are, are just not available. Even parts of this country, it's, it happens as well. Bringing 10 of these guys, right, who currently are the problem, right, considered the issue in, in our society, right? This is a group that society has dubbed ready, they're basically their, their plan, like, you know, there's some graduating, how many are graduating? Was it 10, 13, something? I don't remember. <laughs> are graduating, like your course has been this, this, currently you're here, and then you're on to do amazing things, right? This group I'm talking about, you know what their plan is? Two places, jail or the grave. That's the reality we're talking about. Now this is how God can do what God does. That group who society has written off, they're done, right? They're, this is where they're headed. They're gonna go, and we've already had the invitation, over to Uganda and trade 50 to 100 people on how to build and develop these systems. That is why we do this. Give God the glory because He can do that. Right? When they talk about Jesus, like what good could come out of Nazareth, right? And they say, out of that, what? What could possibly come out of there that's any good? It can't possibly be Christ. Well, what good could come out of Humble Park? What good could come out of, of, of L.A.? What good could come out of Detroit? There's plenty of good. When God can redeem, God can redeem everything. So, excited about it. I know I talk a lot about it. I'm sorry. I promise I'll leave time for questions, but it gets me really excited. <laughs>
So this is an idea of what that training would look like. This is a starting point for those who stick with it, right? Because understand, again, as was mentioned, Joanne mentioned in the beginning, you're doing business in excellence. Yeah, I mean, justice for sure. We want to have impact. But you have to do it really well. This is, these are businesses that we're, do, that we're launching. If the businesses don't succeed, we don't have a chance to do the ministry. Right? That's, that's our model. That's not everybody's model, but that's how we're doing it. That's our focus. Training, six months. Internship within one of the, with one of the businesses in our portfolio. Employment, and you can, you know, that's driven a lot by the, the need of one of the businesses, how soon they'll need an intern to go to full employment. Ownership. Those last two of what God has shown us is, is not been done. And this has been the, the biggest area of challenge. All this has been great. Like, everybody's been on board with this. I know when we talked to. Those last two up there, they're like, you're crazy. Don't do it. You know, slow it down. Like, the, you can imagine the conversations we've had. It's been, it's been quite a year. But the fact that we're going to basically say, you're gonna, we're going to take these young folks and prepare them our, our, we're not preparing them to get a job. We're preparing them to own these businesses, to take ownership. That's what we're preparing them for. We're pouring into them for that purpose. So the last two of ownership within one of the social enterprises we've already started, or take an idea that one of the students has, right? Student and then employee, and give them all the resources necessary to launch that next business. That's the direction of the stewards market. So again, our conversation for today. Allowing God to write your plan. This, might, this is going to sound a little crazy, guys, I promise. So how, do, how did it happen? These last, these last three months have just been incredible. I'm going to tell you, I say incredible now, I'm glad I can stand here today and still say incredible because a few months ago, there was a chance that there would be no stewards market. It was a reality, and it's something that we live into still today. We were pushed to the limit of, of our capacity, pushed to the limit of our will, and we got to the point of absolute brokenness, to the point where we had to sh literally shut down for a moment. We had employees had to be let go. Employees decided to go different direction. We lost customers, contacts. And at one point, it seemed like it was inevitable that the steward's market would not continue. God got us to that point, this point of surrender, and it's been remarkable ever since. So I wanted to share a little bit with you about what that would look like in your own lives. You know, I believe that one of the reasons we went through all this is to be able to share this with others. And I'm not sure what your journey is going to be, but let's, let's, let's take a walk. So for you, maybe there's some right now, especially those who are graduating, you're, you're figuring out what's next. Where do we go? What's the future hold? What will be the opportunities? I guess my focus is more from the side of those who are launching something, but I think it's, it's, um, it's applicable for anyone who's about to step off into this new adventure. If I tell anybody, like, how would you start this business plan, right? I start off by saying, allow God to break certain things in your life. First one is your heart. When we're talking about justice, especially justice-focused businesses, you got to be all in, right? It's not going to be easy work, right? Nothing we do is easy. No matter what career choice you make, it's going to be hard work. So how much better of it if it's something that you're passionate about, something that you love to do? When it comes to, to justice, Focus businesses, allow God to break your heart. Just ask Him and let Him reveal to you the, the, the areas within your community where there is brokenness and allow Him to draw you towards it. Allow Him to break your current ideas on how businesses should operate and how businesses should be formed. We, you know, through our, our 18, 20, 40 years, 80 years, we, we bring in a lot of information, right? And it forms our opinions on a lot of things. And depending on what those influences are, it's going to 
it's going to really steer the way you think about things. What we're talking about here, go, it contradicts a lot of the status quo. So just be open to thinking about things differently. And lastly, I would say, ask God to, to conquer and break your fears. It's an area where everybody struggles at some point. Ask that God would just remove those fears from you and just trust in Him. Okay? We, we encounter it every day, whether it's someone on the team or it's someone within the, the, the broader community. Um, we're faced with it on a consistent basis. And we, we're, we are always, ourselves, just asking God just to remove that from us. We know that's not of Him. So it's nice to say, seek. Okay, so I think about, I go back to January, middle of January, when we were at our lowest point, and this is some of the steps that we did that led us to where we are today. We fasted, we prayed, we worshiped consistently. Those things I can say we did. We fasted not in the sense of just wanting to go through the practice of it, of picking one specific item, but fasting for anything that's going to keep us from truly depending on God. We didn't want to have to be able to lean on anything except on God's sovereignty, God's strength. We prayed, we prayed that God would reveal this plan for us. We tried it our way. We tried it different ways. And they were good, but they weren't the best way. They weren't necessarily the way that God had intended to be. So this time around, we said, Okay, we're here. We're listening. You have our attention. Reveal it to us your plan. This transformation I talk about all the time is definitely finding ways to help transform the lives of our community that we're serving. But again, it comes back to us. God, transform our lives. Transform each life of those who are on this team. The last part of that, he just be encouraged in this process. It's difficult, right? It was difficult for us, but be encouraged because there is definitely hope in what you're doing. And I say worship. Worship in... So when you come into the stewards market, you'll definitely see things that you won't see anywhere. Well, not too many places. You may walk in and in the middle of business day, we may just be praying. There's customers coming into our place. I mentioned that one of our businesses is King Lizzie Apparel. We might be all standing in the middle of the store just holding hands and praying and customers are coming in. So people never know what experience they may see. We're worshiping constantly through song, but we're worshiping as we all should. We're worshiping in, in our work. We're worshiping in the way that we greet customers. We're worshiping in, in the decisions that we make in our planning process. That was a period of just seeking God and listening. And we got to the point where we started to hear what God was saying. And he, he developed this plan for us. He laid it out. What direction we needed to take. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. We went from really trying to do it our way and force it to letting God create the plan and also create the opportunities and bring about all the resources we needed. So what is this, this idea? When I think about the idea for doing something in the area of justice, if I look at a community, I'm looking at a need, probably an economic need, right? That's often what it is. There's a specific, tangible, practical economic need. But this brokenness is also, that's the person, right? There's a relationship involved with it as well. Those two things are happening. And then we're allowing, we're asking God for this last piece, this innovation. What is this new thing that God can show us that's going to help address this need and this ongoing brokenness within the community? The most important piece, in my, in my opinion, this is great. Like, you can do all those other things. Right? You could be diligent and committed and disciplined in your prayer, your fasting, your worship. That's great. You can hear clearly. You could hear clearly God's plan and you can see it. But at the end of the day, if, you're, if we're not obedient in it, if we don't actually listen, if we don't actually do the things that God has laid before us to do, 
then we're still going to fall short. Now, you jump in, you got the plan, you're listening, you're pay being obedient, and now you're on your way, you're on this journey, you know, and we know that it's not going to be just smooth sailing. How many people are heading overseas at some point? Any in this group that are hoping to? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Perhaps, you know. Challenges here, there'll be challenges there as well. There's going to be new experiences that you've never seen before. There's going to be, you're going to have to wait on things longer than you could ever imagine you'd have to wait, right? Stick with it. Stick with it. Trust that God's going to provide. He's going to provide, one, he's going to provide the people. And I mentioned on here this authenticity. When God's doing it, it is authentic, right? When you've, you've asked him to do all these things, you've asked him to break your heart, you've, you've trusted and you're listening to this plan, it's authentic and people can see it. People will recognize how authentic you are being, that you love what you're doing, that you believe in it, and that God's behind it. And it's going to bring all the above. The people whom God specifically has called for you to serve. It's going to bring the people, your team, right? The resources for you to be able to do it well. It's going to bring your customers, whatever that may be, whether it's, you know, it doesn't have to be just retail, that you have customers, and it's going to bring your investors. These happen in different stages, right? But all these things will come. So, I want to make sure I just, you know, gave a few practical steps. If I was to, based on all that, what it looks like in, the, in sort of a three-year period as you're trying to grow uh, a social enterprise. We already talked in depth about the idea. We know the source. We talked about the source of where these ideas come from. And we even talked about the guy's going to bring the team. I can, story after story of people coming to help do the things that we're doing. The connections that have been made are just, or they've been incredible. But understanding where the team fits in. So you have this, you have this idea and you're ready to launch something that I could just, I encourage everyone to build this community. Build a community of people. Build a community of almost family that you want to do this with. That's your team. And they're going to help you on the early stages with the strategy. They're going to help you with the strategy of really planning this out further. They're going to help you with the development of the plan, making it more robust and eventually the execution of it, actually putting this thing into action. So this is all in year one. Idea, team, helping really build it, do the modeling. Within that year, and we can hopefully through questions, we'll get, get into this a little bit deeper, we're going to need to raise some capital, okay? We needed to raise capital, that's a key part of this. So idea, bring the people, and then let's bring in more resources so that we can actually make this happen. And why do we need it? Well, it, it does cost money to do these different things. Modeling, yes, we've got to figure out, let's get an idea, let's test this out. Right? Let's see that this idea, whatever your big idea is, let's see if this thing actually can work. Develop an infrastructure. Once you get it down, you say, this is, this is the direction we need to take. Be able to invest in, in the actual infrastructure so that you can launch this thing properly. And salaries, you want to make sure you can take care of your folks. I'm a big advocate for investing in people. I talk to investors a lot of times and, you know, I'll put a number towards them. Um, whether it's for a for-profit entity or, or, or um, supporters for the nonprofit, And I'm like, well, where do you think this money should go? And I'm like, into our folks, right? Into the people, between, behind, this is relationships that we're doing. At the end of the day, we're, we're developing relationships, any way you look at it. So I think we should invest into the people that allow us to do what we do. Year two, you know, there's definitely more to it, but, and we'll ask questions. Like I was saying earlier on, ask a lot of questions. So this first year, you start off just really just building the model and getting the infrastructure in place, getting the team. Year two, you're going to focus on how are we going to continue to do this. We need to now move to growing revenues, right? There's a certain amount of time that you're going to have to do this and to do it well. So now you have to sh sh shift your focus a little bit to look, let's grow these revenues, let's do these businesses really well. 
add talent. You're going to start with a fringe team, right? You're going to have a few people wearing like seven hats, right? Ask Sarah right now how I many hats she's wearing. That's the, that's the nature of when you're doing startups of any sort of business, ministry, nonprofit, whatever it may be. It's, you got a small team and you go with that. Part of growing revenue is so, is so that you can add more talented people. Year three, now you go to, we need to grow this. We're looking to go to scale. Right? We're going to grow the customer base if that's what you have, that sort of business that you have. Um, cut costs, improve efficiency because there's, you're going to find lots of areas where you are you in survival mode a lot of times and you were just, you know, we're going to get this thing done. But as you have a chance, as you develop and you have more talent around, then you can slow down and actually have people focus on what they do and what they're called to do really well. And it will allow you to be more efficient and um, allow you to operate in a more lean, um, a lean, more lean, uh, um, in a more lean manner. And then this is key, right? Retain talent. We want to keep people around. So how do we, how do you go about keeping people engaged, keeping people excited? You know, there's there's different ways that people try. You know, I've come from all different industries and. You know, sometimes people, for some companies, it's making it more attractive through salaries and compensation, and that's good. That's, that's, that's all, I'm all for that. For me, I've, what I've seen is by allowing people to feel fully invested in what they're doing. That everyone has a part in development, has a part in what we're doing, has part in the impact that we're having. You want to build this sense of community where everybody is, feels called into what they're doing. And it's one of the, the best ways to keep folks happy about what they're doing and keep them around long enough so that this can continue to grow. So that's always, for me, that's always been a big part of it. Um, we have a, a pretty um, level structure, pretty linear structure, where everyone has input. Um, ultimately, I have to make some of the tough decisions, but I, I really enjoy having everybody's input on decisions that are being made. So, just a couple more things. Success. Okay. So, here's a, there's a really hard one, right? Measurements of success. Look, no matter what you're doing, you're going you're gonna to be asked to prove that you're being successful at whatever venture you're doing, whatever, whatever job you're doing, and, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. My past experiences, all right, so I guess there's some baseball players. I see the glasses. There's a ball player right here for sure. <laughs> Playing baseball is real specific, right? You know, if, if, you're, if you're an offensive player, it's batting average, it's home runs, RBIs, pitchers, it's earned run average, etc. So that was, when I played baseball, that's what it was. It was easy, like every day, right, the success was, hey, did you get two hits today? Right, that was a measurement of success. Um, as a commodities trader, well, the way we did it, there was only one measurement of success. <laughs> Can you imagine what it was? <laughs> How much money did you make today? And that was it. That was the only measure of success, it really was. There was nothing else with the, the, what we did. We had no customers. You know, it wasn't how well did we, did someone's portfolio perform? No, it was every day how much money was made for the corporation. So that was the measurement. And everyone, you know, there's, there's plenty of other examples on accepted measurements of success. And I, I believe in metrics, I believe they're useful, but there are, there's other things as well, and there's other ways to measure success. And we're talking about doing stuff that is different. It's little, it's, we're talking about the extraordinary, right? Allowing God just to, to work through you and do amazing stuff that's having great impact. We get to use business as our platform, which is, I think is really cool and exciting. Um, but all for a, specific, for a purpose, right? There's a focus behind it. So we got to be open to doing things a little bit different. I look at this, so I share with you, like, well, we're in a community where there's been nonprofits for, for decades, right? This, hasn't, this isn't new. It's not as if there aren't ministries and nonprofits serving the neighborhoods of Chicago. I mean, there are, there are 
thousands of organizations throughout the city of Chicago. Why haven't we seen the transformation take place? I think a lot of times is there's been a certain way of doing it and people are just continue or comfortable in doing it that way. The, the issues haven't changed, they're still large, they're big problems. So we got to come at it with a big solution. So be ready to try things that may be a little scary, but are different, right? They are, they're going to have the necessary impact to deal with the, with the current issue. I love this verse from Romans. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we're all this, we're a new creation, and let's, let's think in a new way. Let's think in a way that sometimes goes against the grain. It goes against the way that the popular thought, and be willing to try some scary things. New measurements of success. I told you about the ones in my original careers, my earlier careers. Now it's, we look at things like individual growth of a person, right? And we have, we have, <laughs> We have young folks that will never be a customer in our store, right? And at least not for the next five, ten years, anyway. And we stop sometimes and think, like, you know what? Is it possible that God would allow us to do all this here so that we could have impact in the life of this seven-year-old who's not being shown love at home, who's currently being recruited by the gangs on the streets? Is that possible? Is, is, does God do, does he operate that way? And, you know, we've all come to a point of being comfortable saying, yeah, he, he could possibly be like, he is that amazing, and it's possible. That everything we're doing, all the work we've done, I said it started in 2006, could be to transform one life. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to put in that work for one life transformed? Metrics matter, don't get me wrong. And what we're doing, we're do, like I said, we're doing business. So the metrics are important. Whatever it is that needs to be measured, it's good. God is a God of order. We should do that. We should have, keep, keep good information, produce good statistics, no question. But at the end of the day, it's, it's about the relationships, about lives mattering. That's the most thing, most important thing. And this last thing, I put a tax on there. You're probably thinking, like, what is he talking about? A tax. I would have never put this on there. I would have never put this on there last year. But I gotta tell you, what we've seen is that the, the closer we get to doing things well, and every time we're about to do something amazing, here comes an attack on, a, on what we're trying to form. And I'm gonna give you an example, and I shared it, I shared it with Joanne um, uh, over the weekend. We just left New York, right? We were in New York City prior to this, and we, had, we attended, uh, Redeemer had an a entrepreneurial conference, a forum taking place in Manhattan, and we brought with us four of our recording artists. And we're just, you know, we're on a, a, a crowdfunding campaign and we wanted to get them a few gigs as well in New York. So they were doing some concerts. Well, I think it was Friday morning, we had a meeting with the vice president for Warner Music Group. You know, God's favor, we were able to get in and, and speak with him. Very generous guy. Giving us a really good idea on how to do branding. About 15 minutes into the meeting, I look at my phone, there's all kinds of text messages coming in. I finally read one of them, and uh, one of our store managers said, Ron, our store got broken into. They stole all the recording studio equipment. They stole all the TVs. They took merchandise, probably about twenty to $25,000 worth of stuff. And I was sitting there for a minute. I, I couldn't even focus. He's there talking. I had no idea what he said for about three minutes. I'm like... Get yourself together. I was just praying through it. And here it was where we knew for sure why that happened. We got out of the meeting. We, we shared it with the artists. And of course, they were hurt. This is what they're doing. This, their, their, their projects were on those computers. You know, they poured in their heart and soul into this music. And a lot of that was taken. We're walking out of the building and we're in the middle of Rockefeller Plaza. If you guys have been, who's, you guys been to New York? Okay, so pretty busy place. And <laughs> the artist that had the most to lose, he's the engineer, producer, he's got so much work on there and he's actually donated a lot of that equipment and software. He, he stopped, he said, let's pray, let's give God glory right now. So here we are, 
the six of us holding hands in the middle of Rockefeller Plaza. People are walking past in every direction and yelling at us a little bit, but it was good. <laughs> and we just worshiped right there in the middle of Manhattan. And everyone's demeanor changed. People's expression changed. We went from being so hurt and wounded and angry, because that was the reaction of a lot of us, to just being filled with joy and recognizing that, okay, the only reason, if, if, if we weren't onto something, this would not be happening right now. And you're gonna see that. You're gonna see it happen. So just stay encouraged when those attacks come. And just remember, just stay obedient. Remember who the source is. Remember that God is behind it. And he's already seen all this. And he will provide again and more abundantly. And it has literally elevated this group to a level that I could never imagine. This had to happen in order for us to go to this next stage. It's part of the sanctification. So how we measure success? By the number of attacks that come on us. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's great. So quickly, I know I spoke for a while here, but last, the final thoughts. Um, just be prepared for the, some of the challenges that are coming. There's going to be people, as you do this, who are going to doubt what you're doing and say you can't do it. and That's fine. It's okay. Keep moving on. You've been called to it, continue. Trust in what you've already been called to. Be open to where God starts you, okay? I, I know this group is filled with, there's this, a very intelligent group. You're filled with passion and you want to see success. You want to you get it done and you want to you do it now. I know it. I get that way a lot of times too. Be comfortable with just starting somewhere really small and starting somewhere completely opposite of where you thought you were supposed to be, okay? Just be comfortable with that and let, let God operate through you. Again, I say it, be obedient. Obedience, that to me is the key, is the only true measurement of success. Can I be obedient? I, I try to introduce myself, I said from now on, I think I'm not gonna introduce myself as founder and executive director, but as the one trying to be obedient. <laughs> And, and that's it. And finally, I just encourage everyone, just enjoy this journey. This is part of it. It started a long time ago. This is the stage that you're in now. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy everything that's to come. And it's going to be exciting. I look forward to everything that God's going to do in your lives. Thank you. If we have time, <laughs> Sneakers, can I pull one of those out? Uh, I don't have any of the cool hand painted ones, but anyway. Uh, is, there, is there time for questions? Yes. Um, they would be cool to it's like 1130, so yeah. yeah? So, so, yeah, so there are questions. If there are questions, go ahead and start getting them up here, and Rowan will answer them. Yes. Yeah, um, thank you for coming today. Thank you. You mentioned retaining talent as a really important aspect of, I guess it was year three or year two. I'm curious what you found to be just the most effective forms of providing incentive. Um, oh. That's sort of more of a qualitative question, but no. um, as far as just fully investing in people and making them feel right. um, that sense of ownership, what would you say has been effective? Yeah, so the question is the most effective method or approach to retaining talent. And I'm going to share with you the, what's worked and, and where some of the challenges still are. So again, I'll go back to it. Just really wanting the individual to feel that they're part of it. Establishing that from early on. Right? Of course, there's a, there's a period of learning that everyone needs to go through. But let people know that their opinion matters. Like they're a critical piece to this being successful, this happening, that everyone there has a specific role that they need to play. So that's been, that's been really important. You know, I, I always challenge people. I will give people responsibilities far beyond what they think they're capable of. I, I, this is an approach that I think is important. And it's, it's obviously, you know, most people think it's a risk, but that's fine. I don't consider it one. Uh, I am not talented in any of these things that I'm doing. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not equipped to do most of the things that I do. But something that God's allowed me to do is see the person, their talent, their heart, their desire, 
and that has been has been helpful. Challenges sometimes are. Um, I want to make sure everybody can pro provide for their family, and there's been times where it's been it has been challenging. So we we're working towards that. You know, a lot of my efforts go towards making sure that the funds are there so that we can. You know, they love what they're doing, but in the day if they can't. You know, provide for their families and just the cost of living, then it, it doesn't, it won't work out. So, should I answer your question? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Yes? I'm starting a nonprofit yeah. um, ministry or organization. Um, when you go to your um, investors, do you have to show them that you've already started a budget or do you have to save up the money before you ask somebody else to invest in? Um, your ministry, and what if you're just coming out of school and right. you have this idea and you don't have the money? So how do you get started with all of that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So how do how do we get started when we want to launch a nonprofit, especially from the funding standpoint, right? So it's it's you're gonna there's all different experiences, right? And a lot of that comes down to what, what partners you'll be able to find. There are some folks that will love your idea and want to get behind you in every way. Not only will they be willing to provide uh, some of the, the, the funding, but they'll bring their network as well, which is a, a lot of times that's how it, it happens. Those who are most interested and will fund what you're doing are also going to say, look, I want to give some of my time and I have about five to 15 connections as well because they're fully in and they want to make sure it succeeds. Um, I always say it's, it's important to show that, to use the term, you put skin in the game, right? That, yeah, I'm, I'm asking you to support this, but I've all, I'm in as well. I've, always, I've also done this or I've found other partners that want to come alongside of it. A lot of times what's scary for funders is the idea that they're the only one in this, it's that's it's a risky whether it's for profit or non profit. People like to know that one that you're invested, and two that there's other people willing to share some of the risk. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what was a key motivator throughout like the beginning of your business and towards you know kind of going into everything? Key motivator. Wow. So what was the key motivator as, especially in the early stages and, and throughout? You know, I can, go, I can go back pretty far. For me, a lot of it was stories I heard about my family. I mentioned earlier on my family's from Jamaica. My father and uncle, I, I grew up hearing the stories of them being abandoned on the street at ages of four and two. Um, and then growing up, two years later, being in an orphanage. And that's where, you know, that's where they spent their early years and just the struggles throughout that. I've grown up in that. I've grown up with a probably pretty, with an international mindset and understanding of poverty here, but also poverty abroad and what that looks like. So, you know, I've always been aware of the needs of the world. So that's continually motivated me. Um, my full brokenness came from being in Chicago and building relationships with families and seeing the struggles, both financially and also spiritually. So those things really continue to motivate me. Yes, sir. Um, have you seen opportunities to expand outside of Chicago and different parts of the country? Yeah, great question. So the question was, have we seen any opportunities to expand outside of Chicago? And the answer is absolutely. And um, well, actually, we met at CCDA, and uh, that was confirmation. We had several ministries come and ask us if we could help launch something similar in their communities, in their towns. So there, there are projections already going out to 2016 and 17 that a lot of our growth will happen outside of the Chicago area. Absolutely. And some of that will come through the current social enterprises, uh, but a lot of them will happen through some new ones that are being developed. For sure. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, um, we're curious that you said Stewart's Market is a nonprofit, mm -hmm. but then underneath that umbrella you have the or several for profit enterprises. Okay. Is it, yeah. do you have like, we're currently sort of facing a similar situation. So this yeah, is that's like great. The practicality of For sure. Having, how does that work as far as this might be a complicated question? I no, right. Realize, but um, just any pointers for that? Has, 
does that model work well as far as having for, for profit started underneath the nonprofit umbrella? All right. So the question being, um, the, the, the model, our structure of having nonprofit plus for profit entities. So currently, our nonprofit is the only entity that we have. Looking into the future, each one of these, they're, they're considered programs within the stewards market. Okay, so everything's within the 501c3. But as they grow, they will be launched into standalone entities. For us, currently, the LLC is the best structure for us. But we're looking at different things. We're looking at, look, what's the co-op model? I'm very interested in that. And for depending on the business that you're doing, you got to consider different structures. L3C is another one that's still offered in certain states. It makes more sense in certain states. It doesn't make sense in Illinois yet. Eventually, it will. There's certain legislation that's coming on that's going to improve the capacity and the capabilities and, and make it more attractive. I've been watching it for three years, and it's not there yet, but it's, it's getting there. So a lot of it depends on where you are going to be operating and uh, the type of business that you have. But that's, that's our plan. I'll get you next. Sorry. The um, new businesses that your employees are beginning to develop or you're trying to step into that direction, will they be included under you? Will they be like part of your business or will they be completely their own like, you, of the employee? Right. Yeah. So the, the structure of it, all the new businesses that are being launched or will be launched in the future. So an employee goes through the program, eventually comes with this idea, um, we'll help them with the business plan, um, we're going to help them raise the capital, and we will, but we will continue to have a role within their company. We want to we build this network, right, so that we know we have other avenues to train individuals and then place them. So these will, they will stay within the portfolio, but we will not have full ownership. We want them to own it, but we'll have a, a, a portion of, of, of ownership. Yes? So um, if the program doesn't work, do you take those employees back and, and push them into something else? That's a great question. Are we there yet? <laughs> so, something, so nothing fails in, in our... <laughs> So the question was, like, what of these business doesn't work? So we, we started off the year saying, look, King Lizzie Apparel, that's on the chopping block. I mean, that's just being completely honest. If it doesn't work this year, what are we going to do with it? So yeah, absolutely. So the idea is the stewards market is a community, right? No matter which, which one of these entities you're part of, you're part of our community. We're not, get, we're not going to get rid of somebody because a business failed. That's just, that's just a tool and that's just a method of, um, uh, for absolutely allowing somebody's life to be transformed. So they're going to find another place. Do we have more? Yes, we have further developed that to do it better. Absolutely. But that's the vision, is that we would not kick somebody out. You didn't get expelled from it. You're still part of the family. Right? You'll always be part of the family. We've got to figure out um, what's, where can we get you up and running again. Yeah, great question. Definitely. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So how do we look at how do we look at these failures, right? So if something fails, so we've 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 declared that God's writing the business plan, right? So what happens if something doesn't if something fails? Well, I guess we could have a deeper conversation on what do we consider failing. Um, you know, is it uh, is it the next stage in what we're doing? Um, what happened during that time? You know, who who are we able to attract into? Again, I say it, the community, this family, because of that vehicle. King Lizzie Apparel is a, so. We just to let you know, we have 22 square feet of of storefront space that we operate everything out of right now. The front is King Lizzie Apparel clothing line. We've attracted more young people through that than anything else. A lot of them don't even know the stewards market exists. They know of King Lizzie, right? If you try to make the connection, they would be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Nor do I care, right? I like the fact that you have very bright sneakers, you have the cool t-shirts, and we can play video games every now and then. So <laughs> that's what they know. So let's say that goes away. Let's say that doesn't exist anymore. I, you know, is that a failure? I mean, has it failed? Does it actually fail? We still have built these relationships. They're now understanding 
their relationship with us and that they're part of this community. And it will be something else in the future. I think the failure only comes in if we're not listening specifically on what God's telling us to do. I'm talking about on the day-to-day -day basis. The day-to-day -day basis. What's the next step to take? That's where our failure would be. I don't know if I answered your question. I hope I did. Yes? Have you had any challenges where um, any individuals have not pulled their weight? And if so, how do you handle that? Yeah. So, so what do we do when someone doesn't pull their weight? Yeah, that's a great question. So I know a lot of times in ministry work and nonprofits, people are afraid to, oh my, I consider it a fear, to tell an employee that they're not working hard or they're not, they're not doing, they're not performing. Well, I'll go back to it again. Yes, we're a nonprofit. We are a business. We run like a business. And there's a thing called accountability for all of us. And everyone needs to do what they've, uh, basically what they signed up for. Right? So there's two ways. There's those who are just not putting forth the effort. And then perhaps there's times where this person is just not, uh, and probably wasn't a good fit to begin with. So those are two things that we've had to address in the past. And we, we know it'll happen again. So we look at this, if we're working and we're supposed to be doing all things unto God, we consider our work our worship, right? Well, we should be doing the best that we can. Part of how this came to be is my time spending with other nonprofits and just really not being happy with the way they, they're operating. With accepting less than, than, so there's a kind of like a world standard and a lot of the nonprofits were okay with doing it not even at that level. If we're representing something that's of God, we should do it at the highest standard. We should set the benchmark, and that's how we look at it. So we challenge each other constantly. Sometimes we haven't done it so great, but through experience, we've learned to address things right away. You know, last year, you know, we've, we had all sorts of experiences like that. I've had to let people go. I've had to let a friend go, which was like someone that I knew long before Stewards Market. That was difficult. That was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Um, so yeah, you know, we, we hold each other to a high standard, but you know, we do it in a way that's it's definitely, we hold each other accountable, we do it in a loving way where we're gonna, we want to address it right away, we want to help that person develop as well. Yeah. I saw a couple other questions. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much. I, I have a question that might be a little bit, I don't think it's off topic, but maybe challenging. Do you see this work, when you all involved in this work as charity, good works, or justice? Or how, how would you characterize that? How would you frame it? Yeah, wow. I'd say it's, it's I, if I had to choose between the two, it would be more along the lines of justice, you know, because we're, and that's a lot of that's been directed by our, the community that we are planting roots in, where we see a lot of these systems that we consider, these, there's things in place that it seems almost impossible for our young folks to ever overcome. And the statistics would prove that we're accurate, where the prisons are increasing, uh, recidivism is a, at an alarming rate. When you have 25% of African Americans in, in Illinois that are incarcerated, that's a problem. <laughs> Right, and it's not, it's not going away, it's not going down, it's only growing. Well, more than 50% of our students are dropping out of school. So all, you know, you've heard the statistics, those are in place. So we believe that falls more into the area of, of justice. We need to hit this. There's something, there's, there's a broken system. There's been a complete failure and breakdown and, and it's in multiple areas, right? We could, we could look at the family structure, we could hit education, we could, all sorts of things and again maybe I'll come back and we can have that conversation because um, it's something that we, we talk about a lot but for us it's 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 more it's justice yes like a follow up then so if it's more of a matter of justice have you thought about then or are you engaged in actively and intentionally trying to change some of those structures of power both kind of involving yeah. quote unquote politics or doing so behind the scenes and stuff yeah yeah no it's a great question so 
we do consider it justice. So the question was, if it's justice, um, are we looking to find ways to break those structures, those systems that are in place? And I think I'd be a complete disaster in politics, for one. That would, <laughs> I would never, I wouldn't have uh, much of a career. But yes, and we, we, we ch when we were even, as we're writing through this mission statement, man, we debated about this a lot. And we thought about, like, to try to go head on with these systems, I don't think it's the right approach. And for us, it's like, let's create the alternative. Let's create the alternative structure that's very attractive. Alternative structure that creates opportunities. And all right, so here's an example. This is specifically for what we're doing. Our target, 18 to 25 year olds, mostly young men. Okay, a lot of them are in, involved in the drug game. Okay, I cannot walk up to a young man and say stop doing that and expect him to stop doing it just because I want him to stop doing it. He won't. Okay, that's just not going to happen that way. There has to ha something has to happen in his life and for him to be transformed. That's first and foremost. Secondly, we have to create this alternative opportunity. Okay, so when I talk to young guy, I'm not even talking about the ethics behind the drug business. Let's not even go there because that's not going to be received. Oh, what we need to focus on is saying that King Lizzie Recording Studio is so attractive that I no longer want to spend my time here. I want to spend my time here. And once they spend their time here, then we can pour into them. And that's how the systems will be broken. When there's no longer anybody participating in those systems, then they'll go away. But until there's a secondary system created, those systems are not going anywhere. You can fight them all day long. They're there to stay. So that's, that's our approach to, to combating that. Yes? Um, yeah, I think you mentioned before that you have people come to you with ideas for a business. Yeah. Do you do the opposite and go out and search for people with good business ideas? That, like, you, you, you hit the jackpot when someone comes to you with a great idea, but do you try to actively, in growing your business, go for other people who have ideas? It, it does happen from times. So I have this, it's a blessing and a curse, I suppose, where I have like 200 ideas in my head right now. So I don't want any more ideas a lot of times. But when I hear something, absolutely. You know, we had, we had something this weekend that we thought was great, and we thought it was, definitely could be like a next stage of like our recording studio business. Like, wow, that's incredible. Nobody's doing that. We'd love to maybe, and a lot of times I offer it in this way that a lot of people have a goal of becoming national or global. We'll say, well, when you're ready to do it in Chicago, talk to us. We want to be that next level because we line up. And that's the, with the alternative energy business, that's how it's going to happen. We made a connection. Um, it's a group out of West Virginia. And they're a nonprofit, but they want to launch the first actual social enterprise, and they want to do it through us. So that, that did happen that way. Other times where it's happened where um, we've reached out to an existing business and, and, and wanted to partner, uh, there's a, I was at a Nifty, you guys familiar with Nifty? So it's an it's a entrepreneurial training, and they work in high schools, and a lot of times they're in a lot of the urban communities. I don't know if they operate as much in the, in the suburbs. But there's, they had a, they've had competitions, business plan competitions, and the winners get some seed money, and they can launch their businesses. 16, 17, 18-year-olds that are doing this. Well, they had uh, their end-of-the-year gala recently, and I was there, and one of the businesses that was highlighted was a clothing line. And they, they actually cut and sew. They actually make their own clothing. They print t-shirts. Real nice. Real nice. I went up to them and said, look, you do it better than we do, so we should talk. <laughs> right? So there was an instance where we were in the same space, and they not only have really nice product, but they market it. They market themselves, and they market the product well. So we're going to discuss how we can do things together. Yep. Any other questions? Yes? I don't know if um, you'll know this, but with the alternative energy that you're talking about, so you want to move that, as I understand, to the for profit. Do you know um, how many like dollars per watt you're, like, are you going to be able to be competitive in that market? If we go forward, we're going to have to be competitive in that market. So for alternative energy, can we be competitive? Uh, if we're going to do it, then yes, we are. 
I am I'm a, completely a student right now. I'm trying to read as much as I can, and this is not my expertise, right? So again, I'm the person who either has the idea or gets excited about an idea, and then I try to find the people who are really good at what they do to bring them on board. So fortunately, I have the, 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 the people who know what they're doing, and they're teaching me. So one of the issues with solar energy in Illinois is that they're not terribly efficient there. Right? There's not a lot of sunlight. The weather conditions are... <laughs> who thought? <laughs> right? Um, so it's, for us the model would be more of manufacturing in Chicago and then providing the service out of state. Right, finding other states where it makes sense to do solar energy. Um, so that's that's where we are right now. That's where the research is, and you know, we'll see. I'm I'm hopeful that it works. I want it to work, but that in itself is not enough to go forward with it with an idea. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Kind of piggybacking on Dr. Bronkema, um, like very encouraged by a lot of what I hear. Your focus on justice, uh, very curious about your decision not to go the political advocacy, but to provide alternatives. I think one thing that's key, and I'm fishing here, one thing that's key also <laughs> is to let other people know what you're doing. And I, to put it crassly, it might even be witness or evangelism, and to yeah. say to Chicago, at least, to start with, you know, we believe in a different world. We. Uh, well, I don't mean to be giving you an answer either. No, please. <laughs> I'm taking notes, so come on. <laughs> is, is there a way in which you also leverage, because this is a business class, okay, that you leverage mm -hmm. what you do to say, uh, to bring a message of hope to Chicago? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I love it. Can we, can we leverage what we're doing for a message of hope for Chicago? Man, that's, that's a great plug right there. <laughs> you're hired. You need a marketing guy. You're the guy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, this has been a year where we knew that we would be speaking to a lot of groups. So God made it clear. This is going to be a year where you need to communicate what you're doing locally and outside of the, the, the city of Chicago. So we get a chance to talk to different groups, one of which is the city of Chicago. They have a Department of Housing and Economic Development, the mayor's office. This is where we're now getting in front of. And we get to share what we're doing and why this is an innovative way to deal with the issues of Chicago. And what we found is that they're so hungry for it. I mean, they, this is, it's, it's been remarkable. I mean, we, we had no idea we would have such a response. We went from, we don't know if we're actually gonna get some sort of funding from the city, so by the end of the meeting, they said they would get more funding than we actually applied for. So, you know, and it's because they recognize that this is something different and that there is a major issue and this lines up with of ways of alleviating that. Yes? Uh, in what ways has the, the faith centrality of the stewards market either helped or hindered fundraising efforts and do you think that that will change once you move more into the for-profit world? So how will it, yeah, so being, uh, as we, we declare ourselves, a Christ-driven organization, as we often, that's our, how we lead in, um, how has that helped or hindered fundraising efforts? Um, it has, it's probably done both, I'm sure. It's definitely closed doors, and some people get scared away by that idea. But what it, where ultimately what it helps with is that it helps weed out who we want to partner with, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the dollars are important, right? Those, those are necessary, but you're talking about building relationships with everybody who has a, a role in playing here. And it's scary sometimes. I, found, I, had, I actually, uh, you know, earlier this year, I had to turn down somebody, which, oh my gosh, that's like, what? I'm turning down? When, our budget isn't met yet, and I'm turning down? But yeah, you know, sometimes you have to do that because it just doesn't align properly. Um, so, and it's, it's definitely helped as well, you know. There's people who want to see, and it's not just by us declaring the statement that we believe in Jesus Christ, but people want to see it. They want to see that you're authentic, that you're actually living this out. And when you, when you show that authenticity, people are drawn in and say, yes, that's, that's what we want to get behind. 
pass it back. Um, I know your age target is 18 to 25, mostly men, but the, um, the, the the boys that are under that age but mm -hmm. yet need this training as well. Right. How do you deal with them when there's another um, faith that's involved and the parent do not want you to put your faith onto their child? Right, right. So that's, you know, that's, that's a real thing. So when there is, uh, so faiths don't align, right? So now these are, these are young folks that are still under the uh, protection and guidance of their parents. They're in their parents' home. So a lot of times, one of our one of our connection points is in the school system. So we do still go into schools, and we do financial literacy, and we do these entrepreneurial classes. So we get to speak with you know hundreds of students doing that. We're currently at Orr High School on the west side, and we're developing actual social enterprises within that school. Um, so. A lot of times, it's, you'd, be, you'd be surprised. So before 2009, I didn't think that it was even possible to pray in a public school. Right? I, I don't know where I got that from, but I think that's what I just heard. Like, you can't pray or you can't mention God's name in, in the public schools of Chicago. Until 2009, where I met Ernesto Matias, had a meeting about doing financial literacy in that school, waited in the principal's office on the hard bench, which is really intimidating, even at 35 years old. It's like, <laughs> I said, there was a kid sitting next to me, and I, you know, he's, I think he had a little worse situation than I did, but it was a little nerve-wracking. I waited for 30 minutes, and finally get called back into the office, and uh, he's an intimidating guy. You sit down, he calls in hit one of his assistants, and they close the door, and you know, I'm prepared, I have my, my, I'm ready to pitch and do everything, and he's like, okay, let's pray. And I was like, what did he just say? I, it blew me away. He doesn't do anything without praying first. He won't even have a conversation with you, which is incredible. So right in the middle of Chicago in a public school, which was on the failing list before he came there, here's a guy, Ernesto Matias, who won't do anything unless he prays first. So, you know, kind of just let the Holy Spirit lead conversations, let things like that happen. They have a ministry right in the building now, walking the halls. So those things happen. As far as our, lo our facility, we get a lot of young folks come in. And as sad as it sounds, a lot of their parents don't know they're in there. I mean, when I have a guy who's seven and his friend who's eight, and they're in our place until closing and it's dark, and nobody's checking on them, I mean, they're not asking those questions. So we're going to pour into them. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, there's definitely ways you can outreach them. I think a lot of it's just on the, the business that we've started so far and also maybe the and even the look of some of the product that we carry, you know, it's really a heavy male focus. So I think as we develop that and make it more attractive or, you know, more diverse, that'll attract more, more young women. And then as we add different businesses that are focused more, so a big one in our community is, has to do with hair, right? So some sort of, whether it's braiding or hair care, something, that will, that'll be a big one that will be almost all young women. So we're, we're working on that. We know we have to do that better because there's just as big a need. Absolutely. Uh, but we, we've, we do have young women that work for us. It's just that's, you know, the small minority. Yeah. Yes? I know you've talked a little bit about this, but I was just curious about when you look back in terms of where God has taken you, including your baseball career, are there particular things that stand out? And I mentioned sports just because, you know, a lot of the young people have been well, that you've seen that God used that in some way to develop skills that you're now using. You've seen your yeah. staff or employees in some areas where you wouldn't really have thought that certain experiences yeah. or certain skills would have been developed through yeah. ways. Things that just kind of jump out at you like that that could be a word of Yeah, so to answer the question, how, how has God used these other experiences to kind of build up and develop um, me for what we're doing now? Um, I think I'll start with trading with the commodities business. You know, I had no experience in this whatsoever. It's a high risk sort of business. And the 10 years that I did, it would allow me to do is, you know, just be okay with taking risks. The idea of, you know, trading, 
You know, any any point in time, you could have swings of in hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, it's not scary to me anymore. So it also freed me from any sort of this sort of uh, dependency on on finances. You know, I'm willing to be stretched in that way, and I think it's very beneficial for what I'm doing. Um, it gave me a broad sense of how interconnected everything is, of just watching uh, world markets and seeing how one thing impacts lives and how another thing impacts. So I think those were very useful uh, tools from trading. Uh, as far as baseball, I tell the story all the time, I was the worst baseball player on my Little League team. I, I was the worst. I, mean, I, have, I have the stats to prove it, too, <laughs> which my wife will pull out and remind me all the time. Every time she wants to keep me humble, right? Rowan, remember you were the worst on the team? Think like you got the award for being the best cheerer on the team or something like that. <laughs> so I was not good. And for some reason, I love to play. I don't even know why. Uh, I had injuries. I, I was bad. Why would I still play this game? But some reason, I always had heart for it, passion for it. And uh, all of a sudden, some, it just started becoming easier for me to do. And by the time I was in high school, starting to get recruited, and then went to college and, and played. And in college, I you know, really started to play well. I got a chance to play and get drafted by the, as you mentioned, the, the Texas Rangers and played in the minor leagues for part of five seasons and, and then it was done. Right? So I'm like, God, you, you know, here's this, you got me on this path, it looks like everything, you know, I'm going A ball, double A, heading to triple A and then I had this massive injury and that was the end of the career. I'm like, okay, this is how the story ends? Like, that's it? <laughs> like, that's not how I envisioned it. If you go back to 1997, my second year of playing, I was, I can remember driving um, from Florida to Tulsa, Oklahoma, A ball to double A. I was there for four days and driving back. It's like a, I think I got lost, so it ended up being like a 24 hour drive straight through. It's a lot of car time by yourself. And I remember the conversations and the prayers and the crying and the wrestling with God in that car. He had brought me to a point of absolute brokenness where I stopped doing it for myself in full surrender. By the time I got back to Florida, he surrounded me with people who would lead me to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That happened in the basement of Fort Myers Stadium, Lee County Stadium in Fort Myers, Florida, and led by a chaplain through an organization called Baseball Chapel. It's an actual Major League Baseball organization, which nobody's ever heard of besides me. <laughs> By uh, a really underfed, malnourished pastor named Jeff, who was like, he was like 6'2", he was like 140 pounds. I remember how skinny he was. I was thinking like, oh, this poor guy. <laughs> right? And coming to Christ down in that basement, so before I was mentioning that, is it possible that Stewart's Market exists so that the Nikes of this world will come to know him? Is it possible that I play professional baseball so that I know to come Christ? Yeah, these, these things are possible. Absolutely. I believe it. If I, and I look back and I'm like, yeah, you were terrible. <laughs> there's, no, there's no other reason why you would come to play baseball at that level. There's no reason why you would continue to want to play. So I look at baseball and I'm saying, is, what have I learned? What came of it? That, that, that's it. My life was forever transformed. And th there's nothing greater that's ever happened in my life through it. Any other questions? Yes. Things. Yes. Say a wee bit about the name, the Stewards Market. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sure. people refer to their businesses as their kids, and right. so it's always interesting like, right. why why pick a name. And then at the on the second part of that is a bit about the solution tour and what you guys are doing. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. So the first question: Where does the name Stewards Market come from? We started off, always have, even as part of our financial literacy training, has this idea of stewardship, right? Of time, talent, treasure, all the above. Really knowing how to budget what you have well. So stewardship has always been a key to what we 
of what we share and try to develop an individual. So that name, that was the start of it. The market came because one of the first initiatives we did before King Lizzie, when we started to motivate people to use their, their natural abilities to try to alleviate some of you know, their situation. How do you improve your situation? Well, look, what do you have? What sort of wares do you have in your house right now? What talent do you have? What craft do you have? We'll create the marketplace infrastructure. So right outside of Living Faith Church in Cabrini, we would set up tables on Saturdays, like in the parking lot. We basically we would do the marketing and stuff like that within the neighborhood. And it started off with folks just in the church, but then we offered it to other people within the community. So we would create sort of this flea market, farmer's market style where all sorts of items would come out. And um, so we named it the Stewards Market. The only reason we named it the Stewards Market is somebody came to me finally and said, look, Ron, you need to offset some of this liability. You're taking on a lot of risk. And that's just not how I, I don't even think about that. I really don't. I would have never started an organization, but I, it was good counsel. It was good counsel. So <laughs> I said, right, I guess I'll start a, a steward or a, a, an LLC or whatever. I just literally just picked one. It's your question before. I just like, well, whatever. I'll just do this LLC. It makes sense. <laughs> and um, I needed a name. So <laughs> stewardship has always been at the core of it. We started off with this idea of the market. I believe the market is a powerful tool, powerful platform for transformation. So I, I, it, it made sense for what we're doing. And it's, it's just as appropriate today. Yep. And the solution tour, thank you. So right now we, we, we've launched a campaign. It's called the Solution Tour. And this, is, this has been a big part of why we're out here on the East Coast. We look at our current situation in Chicago, and I don't know how much of this news travels nationally, but the, the violence in Chicago has gotten to an alarming state. I mean, it is out of control. We all know people who have either been shot or who have died within you know, these last six months. It's been shocking. It gets to a point where it's almost numbing. You're like, it just, you know, someone else is coming in saying that their cousin was killed or their sister was killed, and it's, it's senseless. So our idea of, again, how do we step up the pace where we can get a lot of these young folks plugged into this alternative? We got to get them away from what they're currently doing and plugged into these training academy. We believe that this really is a, a viable method for alleviating the crime the poverty and a lot of the other ills of, of Chicago. So the Solution Tour is part of a whole crowdfunding campaign that we're, we've kicked off to try to raise money for, uh, for the Academy that's going to launch July 15th of this year. But even beyond that, it's about creating awareness and getting people motivated to do something. We want to get awareness of what's going on in Chicago, but we want people to be aware of what's going on in their own communities. Can we encourage other people to launch an academy in their city or to launch a co-op in their city or a school in their city, whatever it may be. We want to be part of that. We want to help be a catalyst for people to do the same thing because we know what's going on in Chicago is happening throughout this world. So hopefully we can be part of that um, and see, see some of those successes take place. Yeah. That's about out of time, so there's time maybe for one more question if anybody has one. Yes. Um. The youth that you get, I know they're challenged, challenged in many ways. Do mm -hmm. you have resources that you can either send them to? Because as you said, you're still on the training ground yourself. So Definitely. are there counselors or people that you have already in place that you send them to? Sometimes, so the question was, do we have other resources? Yeah, because a lot of the young folks that we work with, there's, there's other needs as well, things that we cannot address. So we do have some resources. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges, uh, even before someone would go into the academy, is illiteracy, right? So there's high levels of illiteracy within our communities. They're, they're, they're not reading on anything above a second or third grade level sometimes, whether, and they're teenagers, and they've been passed through and, and been allowed to graduate year after year. So that's a, that's, right now, that's a, that's a big one. And we have some other partner organizations. Uh, so GRIP Outreach for Youth is a big one, and they provide some resources already. So we are definitely working with other people. We need to develop more um, infrastructure, we need more resources to, to address with some of the other needs as well that we definitely are not equipped in. So yeah, always looking for partners and um, we do what we do and we hope that we do it well and find folks that are, are gifted in other areas as well.
Yeah. Well, thank right. you so much for you joining me and thank you, Rowan. Thank you. Thank you very much.